She cannot move. She can't move more than this. That's it. That's what she's got. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Once again, my name is Brandon. I'm an acting and performance coach. And today we are watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 1, Episode 9, The Puppet Show. It's the puppet show. I don't look, I'm going to have a little bit of a problem with this one. There's a lot of really good things that happen in this episode. There's a lot to be interested in. There's a lot to be excited by. I have an issue anytime the antagonist or the presumed antagonist to a show is a puppet or a doll or <laughs> a leprechaun. You see those moments in the movies and the scenes like in, in the child's play films or in anything where there's a puppet or a doll that's the, the evil thing where they jump on them and the protagonist yeah, catches them in their arms and they just start shaking like this. <laughs> I'm supposed to buy it. I'm supposed to like get be threatened by it, but I can't. I just can't. I can't. I, I, it's completely distracting. I just can't get into it, but we're going to do our best. It does have, like I said, there are a lot of things to be excited about in this episode. There are a lot of really positive things about this episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Leave me a comment in the comment section down below. Check the description for all my social media links, including a link to the Patreon, where you can get full reactions to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, including just everything, just full unedited reactions. Also, hopefully soon, if not already, there are our reactions and videos on other topics, other films, other series. Uh, for anything other than Buffy, you will need a copy of whatever the product is, whatever the, the property is uh, for yourself, whether it's through a streaming service or a physical copy or a digitally owned copy, whatever. Watch along with me on the internet. There is a link to the Discord down there. Also, great community, great people. Come say hi. Let's just jump into it. This is Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 1, Episode 9, The Puppet Show. POV. It will be new. Low POV, waist height, a little high for the puppet. I mean, already by the title, we're a little bit misled. We already kind of feel like the puppet's going to be the antagonist. Love, love this. Yourself is the kill it, kill it. Lover. Get it, Cordelia. Never to Look at Giles' face. Look at him. And that was just dread. Save that for the dress rehearsal, but Lisa. <laughs> I mean, come on, though. Like, seriously, if you're directing a show like that, you have a student singing. The last thing you want to do is, like, completely wreck her confidence. Like, come on, Giles. If you had a, a shred of decency, you would have participated, or at least, um... I think I'll take on your traditional role. And mock. And, and laugh. laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that laugh was great, by the way. We think school events are stupid, and we Snyder. think authority figures ought to be made fun of. No, no, we don't. Well, unless you do. Love that and answer. We... Yeah, but we were fighting a demon... Fighting? Not fighting. No, no, we are left to avoid fighting. I know that, that it's supposed to be a joke. Ha ha, Buffy's not good at undercover, but come on. We got that in the very first episode, right? We got that in, in Welcome to the Hellmouth. That gym was full of vampire asbestos, and that was that was bad enough, okay? But I can forgive it. It was a pilot episode. They were really trying to punch that one on the nose. But this, we were fighting a demon? I mean, the caption completely spelled it out, and she essentially said the entire phrase. That's insane. That's insanely bad at keeping secrets. That's really awful. That's like that's like you know Tom Holland on steroids. You know. I know the three of you will come up with a wonderful act at school to watch. Mm. And Giles is a bit smug about it. Would you like to tell some jokes? As a matter of fact, it is. It's also a wood nose and a wood mouth. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, the actor is doing an amazing job. Can we just check that face real quick? And a word check mouth. his face here <laughs> in this embarrassed moment. All the subtleties, the little ticks, the swallow, the eyes. It's all great. Great all work. Right. You are the worst. Even I can see your lips move. <laughs> I worked on these jokes for weeks. My jockey shorts are made out of better material. <laughs> And they're and edible. <laughs> Hello? They're really leaning into a little bit here, but throughout the show, they really lean into sort of the horror vibe in this one more than they have in recent episodes. The first. Now, look, okay, again, POV. Hello? Knee height. I will be flesh. The same black and white as the opener. A dramatic scene is the easiest way to get through the talent show because it doesn't require an actual talent. Well, look, I will say this, though. It doesn't actually require one because all you have to do is read. If you just read and you don't care if you're any good, then, yeah, it doesn't require talent, I guess. Mm -mm -mm. 
Look at the goodies. Where did you come up with that voice? Kind of an imitation of my dad. I'm the one with the talent here. Once you go wood, nothing's as good. That's a little uncomfortable. Kids today need discipline. I know Principal Flutie would have said kids need understanding. Kids are human beings. <laughs> Woolly headed liberal thinking. Children are human. Ridiculous. I love it so much. Kids. I don't like them. Clean, orderly, and quiet. Of course. This show, these writers are geniuses at doing that, of leading leading cuts, you know, taking the last line, last shot of a previous scene and really, really leaning into the first moment of the next. It's going to be quiet and you open with a scream for the next scene. It's great. I hate this school. It must have happened just after uh, dress rehearsals. There was a cross-country meet at Melville. She, she, she never showed up for it. But demons have claws and teeth. They got no use for a big old knife. The evidence certainly points that way. Remember the Hellmouth? Mystical activity is totally right here. Do you remember whenever she was like, this is the center of mystical convergence, blah, 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 and it didn't feel right to me? That made more sense. Mystical energy is totally rife here is absolutely something that Buffy would say. I suggest we start with your, your talent show compatriots. One of them may have been the last to see her alive. How did she seem? She was happy, I guess. She was psyched to be doing the show. She was a really good dancer. Here, pick a card. Take note of the fact that but at this point, this is like the third time we've established, maybe the second time we've established that he is not a good magician. That will come into play later. Morgan's just strange. He's always rubbing his head a lot and moaning. They seem kind of paranoid, looking around at everyone. Morgan, did you notice anything weird going on around here yesterday with Emily? Did she say anything to you? She was dancing. Sid and I were talking. So you didn't notice anything weird at... Oh. And knowing what we know about his illness, it kind of sucks to see him hurt like that. It's him. Morgan? Morgan. We have a winner. But Morgan is a grade A large weirdo. That doesn't lead directly to murderer. Guy talks to his puppet. And for his puppet. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Everybody has their own thing. Principal Snyder is watching us all very closely. A uh, Slayer cannot afford that. We will find this murderer, but... I would like to take one little moment to sort of stand in awe of the hypocrisy just a little bit. Can you count the amount of times that Giles really come down on Buffy, really made her, given her a couple of really strong talking to's about not letting her life interfere with her slaying? You can't do cheerleading. You can't go on this date. Uh, you know what happens when you let your school life interfere with your slaying. But all of a sudden, oh no, it's me. <laughs> it's me on the chopping block. It's me in the eye of the of the authority figure. We have to do these things to maintain appearances. It's the one time in the first season that I actually look at Giles and think, you know, you could be a little bit more self-aware. Be a little bit more like, oh yeah, this isn't just happening to me. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Okay. Two to the left. Three to the right. No one, anyone else noticed that when she said two to the left, she was turning it to the right. And when she said three to the right, she was turning it to the left. I notice little things sometimes. Not important. Principal Snyder. What are you doing? There are things I will not tolerate. Students loitering on campus after this. school. Do you need something here? Um, a friend wanted me to get something. He must have taken it and just forgotten to tell me. No, I can't do it. I don't want... She's the one. Just this one more and I'll be free. I won't. I will. How's it uh, going with the talent show? I, for one, am looking forward to seeing your act. Look, Mom, if you really love me, you'll stay away. Far away. There's just a lot going on right now. Get some sleep. Okay, I mean, I mean, mom points. She, you know, showed interest in her school activities. She checked in on sort of her mental health, her emotional state. Didn't push hard enough, in my opinion. Uh, there's just a lot going on right now. It's sort of an invitation for me to to try to just engage a little bit. You know, is there anything you want to talk about? At, at least offering that. But then again, maybe she's very used to Buffy shutting down, knows where this is going, and is just trying to give her her space. We've had some interesting conversations in the comments about Joy's. I do love her. As a character, I think the writing did his service early. Where? I love seeing Buffy freaked out a little bit by like this sort of like I woke up in a nightmare scenario. Behold, you were supposed to leave. <laughs> Example number three: terrible, terrible magician. My song is about dignity and human feelings, and no one is going to be feeling sappy after this all. This is one that of my favorite moments, right here. There's something wrong with my hair. This is great. Oh my god. 
Sandra was right. It worked like a charm. Beautiful. Beautifully done. I think Sid was in my room last night. Well, I saw something. It ran across my floor, under my bed, and then it attacked me. I'm not just some crazy person. I'm the slayer. The dummy slayer? There's nothing funny about uh, that. She makes a good point. They do consistently dismiss her instincts on this show, which they should not, because she's very often right. The whole Xander thing, the pack, yeah? Except that these demons are, are, are preternaturally strong, and, and Morgan is, is... He seems to be getting weaker every day. That's a little, a little intense, buddy. Back off, man. Morgan has other things on his mind. <laughs> He'll get it back after school. I'm still watching you. <laughs> Morgan, that is enough. This guy, I'm telling you, I don't even know his name. and I've never seen him in anything else, but he's doing a really good job. There's a lot of subtleties happening. His characterization is superb. Try not to let other things get in the way. Okay. Can I get Sid now? Gone. Where could he have gone? You put it right here. Where did you get that? Oh, I uh, took it out of Mrs. Jackson's cupboard. I... He's not real. Imagine he's looking for his puppet. I love Xander's confidence here. You watch the dummy. Bye-bye now. You concentrate on reanimation theory. I'll poke about in organ harvesting. Morgan? <laughs> Principal Snyder. I'm not sure how safe it is for a girl like yourself to be here alone. And I know how to take care of myself. All right, then. They really played up the, the Principal Snyder thing here. This is part of where I'm going with the, the misleading of it all and being more than misleading. New character, definitely creepy, and sort of playing into his height, too, with the low POVs. Whoa! Sid's gone. Back into sort of this horror vibe that we've been getting for this episode. Morgan. <gasps> but this part. So they use this chandelier to sort of incapacitate her, to make her, uh, to make it more believable that she would struggle in fighting this puppet. That's okay. But the execution, this, this whole scene is just disappointing for me. Just give me a minute. That was a, a line that you could tell Sarah Michelle Geller was not exactly committed to. And he missed somehow. Oh, he missed again. She cannot move. She can't move more than this. That's it. That's what she's got. He's standing by her head and he missed three times. The first time, she didn't even see him coming. This this was her move. I'm sorry. I, it's just, it's it, it just every time I saw it again and it, it bothered me even more. She's there. She doesn't see him coming. For some reason, she spots him right in time. And this is her evasion. She sees him and does this. It's, and he misses. <laughs> it's not okay. It's not interesting. It's not exciting. It's not threatening. It's not even funny. It's just really, really. Now you can take your heart and your brain and move on. It makes me wonder how he she got the other six demons. Trophies for your case. That would have been justice. Also, what does that would have been justice mean? I get, I get the banter, and they're both like, you know, barbing at each other, even though they're not who they think they are. What does that would have been justice mean? He references, uh, he says, you can take your heart and your brain and go. Listen to this dialogue. Now you can take your heart and your brain and move on. I'm sure, they would have made great trophies for, for your case. case. That, that would, would have, have been, been justice. justice. What? what? That was so contrived, too. It was not good. I just don't like that scene at all. I'm sitting on some guy's knee with his hand up my shirt. The kid here was right all along. I should have picked you to team up with, but I didn't because... Because you thought I was the demon. Now that this demon's got the heart and brain, he gets to keep the human form he's in for another seven years. This is probably one of the few episodes, in fact, maybe the only episode that I can think of, at least offhand, where I really felt like Sarah struggled from an acting perspective. And it, I, But I don't necessarily blame her. Like, part of being an actor is accepting what you're given by the writers. Because at some point, you don't have input anymore. You are playing a character written by other people or another person. You have to find a way to identify with that character, to uh, to believe the words that that character says. That's part of your job. I feel like this is the first time in this series, at least, where I'm, I'm seeing Sarah struggle with the idea of, would I say this? 
Would I be in this situation? It comes through just a little bit like with the whoever's out there, I'm going to hurt you badly or something like that. Whoever you are, I'm going to hurt you badly. Just really, really didn't come off well. It did not come off like a natural line like she actually was saying it. And then that whole speech, that whole little conversation, particularly at the end with the dummy, just didn't feel like it was up to, like it, for another actor, any actor, it could be okay, but it didn't feel like it was up to par with even her like baseline level of acting ability. So I really feel like this is the first time, maybe during this first season, they don't know if it's going to be a success yet. They don't, you know, there's no, there's no huge Buffy fandom yet. And maybe in this episode, recording these scenes with this dummy, she's thinking, man, what am I doing here? Did I really, I signed up for this show, <laughs> you know, so I just thought it was worth pointing out. The show. What? It's going to start. Get them all on stage. Form the power circle. Right. How did he ever get that gig? All those people staring at me and judging me like I'm some kind of Buffy. Now, you should imagine the entire audience are in their underwear. Ew. Even Mrs. Franklin? I'm going to try to keep this short. I don't want to belabor the point, but I've mentioned before that Christmas Carpenter is not the best actress. Here's an example. I don't want to like harp on it. I don't like being overly negative in commentaries, but it's necessary, I think, for me to at least justify the statement that I don't think she's a very good actress, at least in these early seasons. There is a couple of things here that we can look at that, that, that are a good example of how she struggles as an actress. Your breath is a powerful tool uh, when you're when you're going on stage and you need to be sad or afraid or angry, changing your breathing for a few moments before you run out on stage, before you run into frame, uh, getting your body in the state that it would be in if you were really upset. Because we don't breathe normally and calmly and nice and smooth and deeply and regularly when we're sad or angry or panicking. We don't. Our body's in a different state. And one of the ways you can trick your mind into feeling the things that you need to feel is to get your body in the state that it would be in if you were feeling those things. So coming in out of breath, panicky, that's not bad. What I what I can't get past, every time I watch it, it, it kind of just makes me cringe. It's one of the cringiest things that a lot of her deliveries are. She has this thing she does on her face where she just uses all the muscles <laughs> and she's like searching for the word and comes up with Buffy. That's, that's what she lands on. Like I'm some sort of her eyes widen and they dart back this way and back that way and back this way. And she's like, uh, uh, like she's physically looking for the word. I've heard people give that advice to young actors, people starting out. They physically look for the line and it just doesn't look na Nobody does that. People don't do this thing. This is not acting. I'm some kind of... Buffy. There it was. Hey, look, there's a little bit of sincerity happening right here, but my goodness, that moment was just so unbelievable. You? You're the slayer? So, you kill the demon, and the curse is lifted, right? That's the drill. When I say free... You mean, you mean dead. dead. Don't get sniffly on me, sis. Of course, if you want to snuggle up and come... So that horny dummy thing really isn't an act, is it? That's another line that is definitely not her best. Hey. Oh, that's that then. Um, everybody, uh, get ready. No one's missing. So the demon isn't in the show. It seems not. Uh, tell the others, look, it's nearly cut. I must get the show running. And then the brain grows. It's very well done, though. That's awesome. The sound effects were great. <laughs> but why would the demon have rejected the brain? I mean, I thought Morgan was the smartest kid in school. This means that whatever's out there still needs a healthy, intelligent brain. What? Remember, we have established this kid is a terrible magician. We just established he's working with a real live blade that can Shut cut a melon in half with no problem. So now you're going to take your body and put it into this machine with this blade and let this kid operate it? This 16, 17 year old kid who has proven that he is a terrible magician. This does not feel like a Giles decision. Self. I mean, he is really... Yeah, he's super smart, except for the fact that he's putting himself smart. in a guillotine and letting a really bad magician drop a blade on his head. Shouldn't it be aimed at my neck? No. He let himself be strapped in. This is so stupid. Oh. Ew. Where are the keys? Mark's got it. And then at this point, I'm wondering, he's free from his shoulders down. Why doesn't he just slide down and get his head out? There's no way that thing is holding his head in there. Ah, yeah. 
Timing is impeccable. It's not enough. Thanks. <sighs> and do we love that they use the, the, the sound effect that they use when vampires get dusted? They were really lazy in some moments with the sound sound effects on this in this series. It's over. Curtains up. I love Snyder's reaction here. This, it's the best ever. It's great. I don't get it. What is it? Avant-garde? Yes, yeah. Avant-garde, for sure. Oh, Oedipus, Oedipus, unhappy Oedipus. That is all I can call you and all that mm. I ever shall be. Buffy, you must commit. You just look foolish if you don't commit. Spend Xander's giving no it, man. Taste. Xander's giving Madness it all right now. If I were a, you know, a high school drama teacher, and, and I'd be like, okay, bro, come work with me. I can I can help you. But man, he really worked. He went for it, dude. So good for him. One of the things there at the end is you see a lot of people in high school especially, but still in college, you see a lot of people, particularly like people who are just in different vocations, like like whenever I would work with uh, the music department and you would have vocalists on stage, the professor, whoever was over the performance department or the vocal department or whatever would want to do a musical they wanted. You know, you could do Into the Woods, you do Hansel and Gretel, you know, different things. And you want someone to come in and help these kids. They, they're going to have to get off the stage and act a little bit. Something really common because, okay, for athletes, it happens because, you know, they're they're cool. Whatever. We got a rep to uphold. I can't get up here and look foolish. Uh, so I got to get up here. And in order to keep from looking foolish, I'm going to pretend that I have no interest in doing this. I'm just too cool to even try. And somehow that's going to save me from looking like an idiot. What it actually does is make you look like an idiot. There's nothing more obvious and transparent than being too cool to do something because you're scared you're gonna fail. So you get that a lot from athletes, and believe it or not, and I don't, I don't, mean, I don't know what my audience is when it comes to this stuff, but believe it or not, especially vocalists, when you're dealing with people like from a music department of a of a school, vocalists like pride is a huge part of their persona on campus. They're sort of like the cream of the crop or the top of the the food chain in their departments. Should it be that way? No, I don't think so, but. The thing is, when you're an actor, you would think that the actors would be that way in, in a theater department, that you'd have the lighting people, you have the costuming people, the, the set people, and then you'd have actors feeling like they're above everybody. But to be honest, it's kind of the opposite. As an actor, you're taught, the very one of the very first things you're taught, uh, acting 101, is that everybody's replaceable, that you're not special. And I think part of the reason you do that is because it, that's the way the industry outside of the university t treats actors. And the other reason is that you need actors to be a little humble because saying, hey, you're all replaceable. Anybody can do your job. So don't be horrible to work with. Don't get a huge ego. Don't start making crazy demands. Just shut up and do your job because at any second I can throw you out the door and bring anybody else in to do your job. That sounds great. It really does. But honestly, honestly, like for, for really, honestly, if there's anybody out there watching this who is an actor, wants to be an actor, you're going to go to college, you're going to study theater, they're going to tell you that. Definitely take it to heart in so much as you don't want to be a problem because you won't get cast. If you, if you get a cast in a show and you become a nuisance and a hindrance to the process and you become impossible or hard to work with, they just won't cast you anymore. That's true. But the idea that actors are disposable, especially in a university setting or a community theater setting, is kind of ridiculous because, yeah, maybe you can replace me. You can put another body in my place, but nobody's going to be able to do this like I can, especially as you get into the show. And that's part of the reason they're so heavy on it, because once you get... A couple of weeks into the rehearsal process, it's incredibly difficult to recast someone. So you want people to be humble and listen to direction and be willing to do the work. Because once you get into it, everybody's kind of dependent on everybody else. But the actors specifically, particularly. So there's a reason for that, but that's not what you get from actors. In the music department, you get that sort of, you know, uh, we're vocalists. We're, we're like... We're the whole reason this department exists. And that's great. Musicians are kind of that way, too. Like, I remember we did a musical and the, the musicians, we, we asked people to come in and do live music. And they agreed to do it, but they insisted on being paid. All of us actors and costume designers and set designers and everybody, we all did everything for free. But the musicians, well, now the pianist, the trumpet player, the violinist, they insisted on being paid. They can't, they can't spend three hours on a Saturday for free. Um, it was really frustrating. But what did I start talking about? I just got on a tangent remembering university. I've kind of been in this in a nostalgic place. I was talking about Buffy. So she came up there and she really kind of gave that I'm too cool to be here energy. Now look, honestly, 
I'm out there, whether I'm a student or a position of authority, I look at them and honestly, the one I'm impressed with the most is Xander. He did not do a good job, but man, man did he commit. He he got up there. He delivered. He used emotion. He tried his best. He, I'm serious. I would go to him after that thing and say, listen, I know you struggled up there. You had a hard time or you, you felt nervous. You felt really anxious, but I saw a lot up there that I can work with. If you would like to come audition for me, I would very, very much like to work with you. I think you could be something special. I would tell him to come give it a shot. Acting is a very freeing experience, and I think he could pull it off. He did a good job of committing. And if you'll commit, as a person who's sat in a director's chair, as someone who's coached people through audition material or whatever, I'm telling you, if you will commit, I don't care how much natural talent the next guy has. If you'll commit and he won't, I'll take you every time. And you give me a couple of weeks with you working on a specific piece of material. It's like anybody who's got coordination in their hands. I can teach you how to play a song on the piano. I may not be able to turn you into a concert pianist. I may not be able to turn you into a songwriter, but I can teach you how to play a song on the piano. And if you'll listen and you'll take the coaching, I can teach you how to play that song pretty dang well. Now, not literally because I, I can't play the piano, but you get what I'm saying. Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. That whole last little clip was hilarious. It was great. As far as the show itself goes, I'm not a huge fan of this episode. I don't know if you could tell, but it's not my favorite. <laughs> there are actually fewer redeeming moments in this episode probably than just about any other. It's not the worst episode of the first season, but... There's just a lot of really bad acting foibles. There's a lot of all that really hardcore misdirection. And then suddenly it's this random kid that that, that, that we haven't spent any time on at the end. All of that was not okay. It really wasn't great filmmaking. It just wasn't great filmmaking. It's one of the few times in the series that I can say that the actual structure of the of the episode, like the core of it, the foundation of it, its frame, was not executed well. Uh, I think maybe they had an interesting idea and they just didn't pull it off well. I don't even. I'm not even sure to be honest what the metaphor is here. Like at least in Teacher's Pet, I know what like social commentary they're making. I know what childhood or adolescent struggle in that show, that episode. In this one, I don't know. Oh, there's not a thing. It just seems like a completely throwaway episode to me. So on second, third watch, I do tend to skip this one every now and then. Not every time, but sometimes I do skip it. Those are my thoughts on it. Love to hear your thoughts. I got so many people in the comments who leave these really long, involved, detailed, and fact-filled uh, comments. I really enjoy reading those. I enjoy that you guys are, are so into the show. Seeing the fandom from that perspective is so cool. I love it when you disagree with me. I really do. Like I love that so far, at least, and we haven't gotten into the spike in Buffy th and stuff, which we will like in season four and five, I maybe touched on it a little bit in episode seven. We haven't really gotten into that stuff, but I love being able to disagree with you guys and you guys disagreeing with me and nobody getting toxic. There's nobody like coming in here and just like bashing anything or really just, I mean, it's, this is a fan, this is a universe that we all love and we may have differing opinions, but we can all agree on our general love for this series, for the characters. I think it's great. It's great because I have been involved in some fairly toxic comment threads over the years with this fandom. I'm so far, I'm really ha happy and a little bit surprised that it's been so positive in the comments. So keep that coming. Again, if you're here and you've made it to this point, especially after all my rambling, please subscribe to the channel. You must like something. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, leave me a comment in the comment section down below. Check the description for all my social media links, including a link to the Patreon, where you can get full episode reactions to this series and potentially other series, depending on when you're tuning in. Anything other than this series, though, you will need your own copy to watch along with me. Copyright and things just is a pain. You'll need your own copy, but I would enjoy uh, having you there, having you watch along with me. I, uh, come over to the Discord, shoot me a message. I uh, talk to some of the people over there. They're really great people. With all that behind me, uh, I'll just remind you to please always be kind to each other. And most importantly, be kind to yourself.